a blowout. Eighth inning, 10 3. Bases are loaded for Verlander, who waits out a 3 0 pitch. He swings, and it's a high fly ball. Deep center field. It is gone. Home run. And a huge bat flip to celebrate. All right, Ben, start the show already. What is up, everybody? Welcome into episode six of Flipping Bats with Ben Verlander. We have a lot to talk about this week. We got the storylines. We have my guest, Rachel Luba, agent of Trevor Bauer, Yasiel Puig joining me. We have the voicemail, the hotmail questions, and we have six tool player of the week. And this episode is the first of the month. So we have the MLB power rankings, my top five to get to. So a lot to cover. Let's get right into it and let's start with some storylines. So this past week, emotions were running hot. We had two benches clearing fights. One took place in the NL East with the Mets and the Phillies. We had uh, Jose Alvarado pitching to Dom Smith, who struck him out, and that proceeded to empty the benches. And we also, over in uh, Cincinnati, had the Cubs and the Reds get into a fight when Amir Garrett struck out Anthony Rizzo, and they got into it there. So look, I wanted to talk about both of these, and I wanted to start with, with the Phillies and the Mets. So we had Jose Alvarado on the mound for the Phillies, struck out Dominic Smith. And they, they have a little bit of a pass before. They, they've, you know, they've, they've gone off on each other before. Alvarado strikes him out. Uh, and, and starts mouthing off to each other and, and starts mouthing off towards Dom Smith. And next thing you know, I'm watching this game live. Next thing you know, Alvarado is taking his glove off, throwing it um, like, like, he, like they're getting ready to get into a huge brawl. Um, look, it's a Major League Baseball fight. We know that doesn't happen. But tensions are running hot in the NL East. And then the very next night, back-to-back -back nights, we get tensions running hot. We got Amir Garrett on the mound for the Reds, who I, I'm a big fan of. I played against him a bunch in the minor leagues. Um, but he plays with a lot of emotion. And the Cubs ended up taking offense to this. He struck out Anthony Rizzo and proceeded to, you know, mouth off towards him. Uh, some bad words flying here and there, pumping his chest. I love emotion. I love emotion. But here's where it gets us in trouble. And here's where everyone says, well, look, you're a big, you're a big emotion guy. You, you want showboating, as people say. Here's my whole thing. This isn't showboating. That's not what, I, what I'm a fan of. I'm a fan of players showing emotion. What we had here was pitchers pounding their chest, cussing at other opposing players. Anthony Rizzo is one of the most well-liked players in the league. We had Amir Garrett strike him out, start pumping his chest, MFing him left and right. Javi Baez takes offense to that, comes out of the dugout, flicks him off, and look, you, you, that's what we can't do. We can't show emotion towards other players and expect them to be okay with that. And that's what we had. We had players not only, I, I'm fine if Amir Garrett comes off the mound, pumps his chest, looks to his dugout, starts pumping him up, but that's not what he did. That's not what he did. He started doing it towards the other team, towards the other players, and that's where you run into an issue. But I did also want to talk about fighting in general, since we had two this week. Baseball fights are ridiculous. They're absolutely hilarious. You know what happens during these baseball fights? Nothing. Not a single thing happens. You have two guys mad at each other. They start yelling at each other. They're immediately held back by somebody. And then you have the, the dugouts empty. I've been a part of fights. I've been a part of fights at professional baseball. You feel obligated to jump out of the dugout, and then you just stand there. You literally just stand there. It is the funniest thing in the world, and nothing happens during baseball fights besides guys. It's, it's like the joke. You know, like when, when people like pretend to get in fights, and they're like, hold me back, hold me back. That's what happens. These guys get held back, and absolutely nothing happens. The bullpens come trotting in next to each other. They come trotting in next to each other from the outfield. It is the most hilarious thing in the entire world, but we got two of them. Not one, but two, Friday night and Saturday night uh, in Major League Baseball. And that brings me to my second storyline of the week. Look, we have an umpiring issue in Major League Baseball. And it needs to be talked about, quite frankly. It, this past week, 
We had a lot of issues in baseball, particularly in Philadelphia. We had Andrew McCutcheon uh, on what ended up being a double play, running to second base. He avoids a tag, slides in safe to second. They throw to first. Andrew McCutcheon was called out of the baseline by the umpire in a mind-blowing call. Now, I, I understand... Uh, I, I typically side with umpires when, when they get a lot of hate because I, I understand how hard their job is. But it's getting hard to do that, especially this week. I was watching a lot of games, and this Andrew McCutcheon play, he's clearly, clearly in the baseline, is called out of the baseline, and then they throw to first where he's called safe. Girardi comes out to argue this call, what they're told is that this is a judgment call. There's no, there, there's nothing they can do about it. It's a judgment call. Umpire thought he was out of the baseline. They show the replay. He's clearly in the baseline. Let me also say the baseline is established by the base runner. I could run in any direction I want to get to second base as long as I establish it. And what the runner then has to do to be out of it is establish his line in 100% of the cases going to second base, it ends up being a straight line. And if you veer out of that to avoid a tag, you're going to be out. Andrew McCutcheon ran straight to the base, straight to it. And he was called out. Girardi comes out and argues. They go to review it. They're told that that play is, is up to the umpire's discretion. They actually changed the call at first, so they got that one wrong too. They called him safe. They, called, they ended up calling him out. Look, here's my thing. We have a, and I've talked about this before, and I'm, I can feel myself getting worked up. We have a replay issue in baseball. You can say something is a judgment call. I'm fine with that. Look, then, then put the umpire that made that judgment call on the headset, let him see it, and let him change his judgment. Look, I've had judgments before that I ended up changing my mind after I realized I was wrong. It was so obvious that he was in the baseline all you had to do was look at the video, and they would have changed the call, and they didn't. And that's a problem. And, and, and that's, not, that's not the only thing this week with the umpires. Calls all week were awful. I feel like I heard more about umpires this week than I have in a long time. And look, as a player, as a professional athlete, I am, I am judged by what I do. I am held accountable for, for my, my play on the field, whether that be good or bad. And it's starting to feel... Like umpires are not. It doesn't feel like there's any accountability. And, and it's, we've seen certain umpires for a while now not make the right calls and, and be in the public eye for getting calls wrong. And nothing's happening. We're, they're just getting run back out the next day, the next week, the next month, and continuing to make the wrong calls. And it seemed like this week we just had a lot of it. We had a lot of wrong calls. And, and even when it came to the strike zone, we were seeing calls, uh, just bad calls get called repeatedly. And I brought this up on social media and people were saying, well, at least it's consistent. It's consistently wrong. Just because it's consistent doesn't make it okay. Well, he's got, you, now you got to keep doing it. There's a plate there. There is a home plate. And it is a strike when the ball goes over home plate, and it is a ball when it is off the plate. I don't care if it's consistently called. It's consistently wrong. And it seemed like this week we had a lot of calls that were consistently wrong. And it's something that I hope, uh, I hope, we, get, I hope we see a change. I hope un umpires start getting uh, held accountable. And I hope we start seeing more calls being correct on the field. Whew. Umpire, man, that'll get me worked up every single time. Uh, but I wanted to get into my last storyline of the week, and my storyline here is plain and simple. It is Mike Trout. I want to talk about Mike Trout. What he is doing this year is remarkable. Mike Trout was already the best player in the world. He's, he's playing better than Mike Trout ever has. This is, the, this is the best we've ever seen. Have we seen the peak of Mike Trout? Maybe I, we might be in it right now. Mike Trout is hitting over 400. He's leading the league in average on base percentage and OPS, which is on base percentage plus slugging percentage. He's leading the league in all of those. And 
I, I, I find this guy remarkable. But I wanted to make a point because I've talked a lot on this show about the face of baseball. And I, I feel like the most common response when people disagree with me, which I'm fine with. I'm fine with people disagreeing. I like it. I feel like the most common response is, are you forgetting about Mike Trout? No. <laughs> no, I'm not. Mike Trout is the best player in Major League Baseball, potentially going to be the best player of all time. We're watching him right now. But just because I say another player is the face of baseball doesn't mean that they are the best player in baseball, because I think we can all agree, hands down, the best player in baseball is Mike Trout. And what he is doing this year is absolutely incredible. So I wanted to make a full storyline of just Mike Trout, because I'm watching him night in and night out. And look, he's going, he's going two for five some nights, and it's bringing his batting average down. It's remarkable. Uh, so Mike Trout off to a ridiculous start. And if you remember... Uh, coming into this year, he said, and I quote, I think I'm starting to figure some things out with my swing. I was mind blown by that statement. What do you mean? You're the best in the world. Well, he's now, he's now playing better than he ever has. So it's truly remarkable to watch. And if you don't watch Mike Trout on a night in and night out basis, you're doing yourself a disservice. So that is it for this week's storylines. Now I wanted to welcome in my special guest this week, the female agent, we got Trevor Bowers' agent, we got Yasiel Puig's agent, we got Paige Halstead's agent. She is a badass in the industry. She is taking it over by storm. Let me welcome in this week's guest, Rachel Luba. Rachel, thank you so much for joining me. How are you? I'm doing all right. Thanks for having me. Of course. So I wanted to, to get started with like a little bit about you personally, a little bit about your personal life. So the first thing I want to ask you is like, where did your interest in, in sports start? Uh, I mean, it, I was an athlete in life. Um, I was a gymnast from the age of two uh, through college. And so I've always just kind of been in the world of sports. And then I think once I was in college, I was starting to think about like, what do I want to do for a career? And, you know, my my interest was sports. Um, so I knew I wanted to work in sports and then, you know, trying to figure out exactly what, you know, I kind of honed in on the fact that I'm interested in helping the individual athlete. That was probably largely just because I was an individual sport athlete my whole life. So working for a team or something like that never really interested me as much as doing something for the athlete. So that was kind of where, where that, where that started. What would you say your favorite sport is now? Is it baseball? Is it, what is it? Uh, I mean, I love watching UFC probably. It's still oh. my favorite. All right. But, uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, baseball, I've definitely, I definitely love it. I have a, a different appreciation for it, but I didn't grow up like a baseball fan at all, really. I mean, I was a, oh, wow. a fan of the game very casual fan. All right. So I did some digging into your UCLA gymnast profile before this. So I have some questions I want to ask you from that. So I saw that you wanted to get your pilot's license. Did you ever get that? No, I'm still, that's still on my list to do um my mom actually she also was going to get her pilot's license and, and when i was applying to college i actually got into the air force academy and i was highly considering going there um, and i wanted to be a fighter pilot so that was i've always been very interested in that and oh, wow. flying, so it's still in my all right you're also a bit you're big into surfing how often do you get to surf now uh, very uh, infrequently. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, also, you listed your biggest uh, athletic thrill as going to the Junior Olympic National uh, Championship in 09. Is that still true? Is that, your, is that still true? Um, no, probably now 
I would say like my biggest thrill was probably, so I ended up starting to compete in boxing and fight. Oh. And I think that like those experiences now are more of the biggest kind of like exciting sports for me. You, I'm not, so you're now into boxing or you're, yeah. I, I need to know more about this. Are like, are, are you, if we get into a fight, are you like beating me up? Could you, could you beat me up? Uh, yeah, probably. <laughs> all right. Noted. So, all right. So then you go through college, you're a gymnast at UCLA. Where does the agent side of things come in? And when, when did you decide to transition to that? So my, I, you know, was trying to figure out, okay, what do I want to do? I realized, you know, this idea of being a you know, sports agent. Um, was intriguing to me. Uh, I think it's actually in my UCLA bio that that's what I wanted to do. I want to be a sports agent. Um, so, you know, they tell you interview people or talk to people who are in the industry of which you think you want to go into and their experience with it. So I was friends with a lot of the baseball players when I was at UCLA. Um, I arranged a, you know, meeting with an agent and that was the first agent I ever talked to It's a baseball agent. And I walked in there and he pretty much told me, he was like, look, seems like you think you really know what you want to do. So I'm not going to sugarcoat it for you. You're a girl. And he just like stared at me and I stared at him. <laughs> and I, was like, I have well aware. Um, and I, he was like, well, what I'm saying is you're not really welcome in the industry. And I was like, okay. Like at that point I was a little annoyed. Um, and I was like, is that it? Like, that's all you've got for me. And he told me that he was like, look, I'm not saying you can't do it, but on what I'm saying is it's a boys club. So that's just the reality of it. And I was like, all right, well, this is pointless. Um, uh, and then I was pretty much ready to leave. He's like, look, if my advice would be like, get a law degree because if you want any credibility at all and any chance, you're gonna have to have that. So I walked out of there and I was like, all right, I'm gonna apply to law school. And it kind of, I was dead set at that point kind of on baseball. Um, and I credit <laughs> him a lot, in a lot of ways to that because had he told me like, you know, oh, it's, you know, it's a great industry. These right. are some of the kind of avenues you can take to break into it. Some would have gone oh like this is really interesting now I'm going to talk to a football agent or you know I yeah. don't know but the I've always been kind of the person that if you tell me I can't do something like it's exactly what I want to do and I happened to talk to a baseball agent who told me that I can't do it and so I was like I'm that's what I'm going to do wow so you, it ended up being a, a conversation that launched you to where you are today but if that guy hadn't said and it's because you're a girl. You may have just gone on to like try and do something else, but because he said you can't do this, you're a girl. Uh, that's kind of what launched you to <laughs> to pursue it more. Yeah, uh, I mean, basically, if, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I did have. I started to really like gain appreciation for for the sport. I knew baseball players specifically. I you know got along with well, so I, I could see myself working in baseball. Um, but you know, I had to teach my the industry how to teach myself the sport um again like I didn't grow up necessarily you know just going to games all the time like my yeah. life was gymnastics it was my entire life um but you know I'm a big believer that you can teach yourself anything if you're really committed to it so you ended up becoming one of the you're a huge agent in the game. You, you rep Trevor Bauer, Yasiel Puig, and, and countless others. And I know you said you went to, uh, you would go to games at UCLA. You knew some of the baseball players. Is that kind of how uh, it came about with Trevor? And, and is that where the relationship first started and you met him? Yeah, so he was one of, I met him my freshman year. Um, you know, he was one of the people over the years that, really was willing to kind of teach me things in the game. Um, you know, being a girl, telling people you want to work in baseball and 
you know, not necessarily, everyone's got to start somewhere. I didn't necessarily know it that well. And a lot of people kind of just roll their eyes at me and like, you know, girls don't know sports and, you know, how do you think you can do this? And no one, it was hard to find people that were very, you know, willing to teach me. And I think Bauer was kind of the perfect person because if you kind of just look at who he is, he's, you know, he isn't your typical baseball player. He isn't (laughs) your, he's like not necessarily the most gifted athlete, but he, you know, was able to make himself into something in baseball. Um, You know, there isn't just, he doesn't view things as like, there's only one mold of like the kind of person you have to be in order to do something. And so I think that's why he never really questioned the fact that, you know, this gymnast who says, I want to work in baseball, like, he never thought, uh, you know, you're, you don't fit the mold. He was just like, okay, you know, well, how are you going to get there? And so he was always willing to talk to me about baseball, teach me things, you know, from his perspective. And, you know, we kept in touch over the years. And, you know, he's always been big on exploiting inefficiencies in in the game. Um, And, you know, I obviously kind of do that with my agency. And so I think ultimately ended up just being, you know, a a good fit. And ultimately he switched. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. There's a big difference between him, like, wanting to you know, telling you to pursue this industry and, you know, telling you how to go about it. And then him at some point saying, you know what, you're now good. I feel like you can be my agent because he's super successful in the big leagues. Uh, So there's one thing to say, you know, what, you can do this. Here's how. And then saying, I want you to be my agent. So what was how did that come about? And when was that? When did he switch? So he switched. It was like the end of October, I think, of 2019. Um, But it is a cool, it is a really cool like transition because one, people think like, oh, I was an overnight success or something, which like couldn't be further from the truth. This has been something that's like 10, you know, years in the making. Um, Obviously no one saw that part of it, but he went from, yeah, being the one who was teaching me you know, even just, okay, these are the, you know, different types of pitches that pitchers throw. Um, and, and a lot of very like basic things to, I trust you with my career. And wow. now this was in no way, Bauer's a smart guy. He's not an idiot. He wouldn't, he wouldn't just do a friend a favor kind of thing. And with his career, with his, right. you know, livelihood. Um, so that really wasn't what, made him decide to switch but I think you know he he saw kind of the beginning of me getting into baseball he saw over the years you know everything I learned and then all of the different opportunities that I was able to get you know for myself um you know even working at the MLBPA and I think that was a big shift in once I got to the MLBPA um as a lawyer there where you know, I was starting to gain knowledge that, you know, he didn't even have um, in that, like on that side of, of the industry. And uh, it was probably like, while I was at the MLBPA, I started, you know, thinking about this idea of what if I have an agency that kind of operates differently, that operates much more like a law firm. um, And ultimately, I think creates more value for the player. And, you know, he started to hear me out um, about it and kind of bought in and realized, yeah, this makes a lot more sense. Um, You know, he's big on asking people why they do things the way they do it. Like, what is the, what is the thought behind it? What is, you know, the reason that you're doing it that way? If you don't have a good reason, then there's got to be a better way kind of thing. And he saw that with the agency and, you know, decided, decided to switch. I had to also like recruit his, his family as well. Like his, oh, wow. his dad, that was a tough set. Yeah. So <laughs> it, it was a long process. But I got there. So you, you now you have your own agency, Luba sports, and you touched on it briefly, but what is it that makes you different? What is it that makes Luba sports different? So I, charge basically more of like for the service that I provide and I charge like billable hours. So it's not a new concept by any means. There are a lot of industries, you know, that, 
Um, you pay for the service that's provided. And uh, so I, that's kind of how, how I operate. I don't charge a commission from the on-field contract and then just get to take that commission, you know, for oh, wow. the entire the entire contract um you know other agencies they negotiate let's say a 10-year deal for a player the player could fire them the very next day and they have locked in that commission wow. whereas for me i only i only get paid by actually doing work for the player i also cap it at five percent so in no circumstance is a player going to end up paying more than a traditional that you would then you would pay a traditional agency but for players that are super low maintenance that don't there are plenty of players that you know they don't want they talk to their agent maybe three times a year right they don't really need much from them um i look at it as you know why are you paying the same amount as a player who you know take bauer for example wants to be the most internationally recognizable name in baseball he wants he wants a lot he wants a lot done for him he should be able to get that there should be incentive for the agent to provide that um but you know and he's willing most players i think are willing to pay for a service they just want to know that they're getting value in return um i also just kind of looked at the industry and you know you take i think lindor's contract's a great example of it um the few weeks leading up to his contract you have media people, you have just analysts, et cetera, on Twitter, right? Projecting kind of and predicting what they think someone like Lindor could make yeah. in an extension. They were pretty accurate for what he, you know, in the end with what he ended up getting. So I kind of look at it and I, you know, I ask the agent got 17.5 million over the course of that contract mm-hmm. or negotiating that contract but did the agent actually provide 17.5 million worth of value because you know the everyone was kind of predicting this what Lindor so where did that 17.5 million of value from the agent come from I'm not saying the agents don't do any work or anything like that but is it worth you know that much money wow that makes a lot of sense and from you know a minor league standpoint, making six thousand dollars a year, I feel like I would have provided so much uh, for for an agency. You know, like six thousand dollars a year. Come on, that's a agents would love agents would love that chunk of money, right? <laughs> that's the whole problem in itself. Absolutely. We could get in, we could get into a whole discussion on the minor league salary. But um, so, what is what is day to day life look like for you? Like you you have players signed, um, like when you're not dealing with a particular contract, what does day-to-day life look like for you? Um, You know, during season, it's a lot. There's no real structure to it. Um, Usually if I go, I go to bed every night thinking I'm going to, you know, do X, Y, and Z tomorrow. And then it ends up being nothing like that. Um, The season is pretty much like the off season for agents. Um, It's that's when our work, you hope is mostly done. The contracts are negotiated. Um, But it's, you know, being the middleman dealing with kind of being the intermediary between your clients and the team, if there are issues, putting out little fires here and there, dealing with the miscellaneous stuff that they need. Um, But, you know, there are plenty of days where there's not necessarily much you're doing with your clients. Um, There are other days where things happen that you weren't expecting that you deal with. Um, and then I would say, yeah, majority of the season is for me, usually, you know, developing my kind of analytics part of the agency, um, you know, recruiting, things like that. You've been very outspoken on, on social media about the game of baseball and kind of transitioning into being a more fun game, what would you do? What would you change um, to make baseball more accessible? To make it more fun? You know, I you know I see your tweets. I see you know um, Bauer tweet the same sort of stuff. You guys are both very like, look, there's so much potential for the game of baseball. What what would you do? What would you change? A lot. Um, <laughs> I think one of the benefits though of someone like me coming into the industry is I'm not clouded by this tradition. 
I didn't grow up with it. I don't know your tradition. I don't, this isn't, I, I wasn't, you know, brought up in the sport of baseball. So all of these things, these unwritten rules, things like that, they're yeah. silly to me. I'm like, wait, what do you mean? Like, <laughs> why, why? And so I think the way I kind of look at it is this isn't, it's an entertainment industry. It's, it's a business. Like you gotta, you gotta, you know, capitalize on, on certain things in order to have a successful business. And I think baseball doesn't do a good job at it. I think they're missing out on an entire generation of fans. You know, I grew up in the era of social media and things like that. And baseball is really behind in that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, the sport for young kids, it's not a cool sport. It's not something that, you know, gets young kids excited quite the, quite in the same way as, you know, basketball does or football. 100%. And there are, re there are reasons for that. I think baseball's got to do a better job at, you know, marketing players, at marketing their own sport, at making it cool and exciting. Um, you know, and I think we were talking about this uh, a couple of days ago, but even just the, the broadcasters that you have, they're constantly talking about how, well, back in my day, this is how it was yep. played. And I'm a young kid watching that it doesn't, it doesn't make me feel like, wow, baseball today is really cool. It makes me feel like, wow, this sport isn't as cool as it used to be, I guess, you know? Yeah. I think that's, that was our first interaction. I think on social media was me kind of when I announced this podcast and what it's going to be about and what I feel about baseball and how it's been portrayed for so long. Uh, and I don't want to say incorrectly, just very old school. There's so much potential for the game of baseball. And that's kind of, uh, I tweeted something out about that. And that's where you basically were just like, hell yes, like you get it. And, and that's, that's what it is. And that's why I wanted to bring you on because I know you're also in an industry that can be very stuck in its way and very old school and very like, this is how you do it. And just to see you tweet about like, um, and I've said that before, like you, kids coming up, basketball is just fun. Like you can see the guys having fun. You can see, you can hear it in the announcers. When they're talking, they get excited like they're fans. It's not, oh, uh, LeBron James just dunked that. It's like, oh my God. And that's like, that's what the game needs. It needs to evolve into being fun and people that are talking about it being fans of the game. That's what I am. I'm a fan of the game. And it sounds like you yourself are, are a big fan of the game. Yeah, no doubt. I, I think that's like, I've, you know, even watched with my family again. So I didn't grow up in a baseball family, right. none of that. And I, my parents and my brothers couldn't have been more disappointed in the fact that I went into baseball in person. Like, <laughs> Why? That's so boring, Rachel. Like a, every sport you could have done. Why baseball? And, you know, now I've gone to a point where, you know, my siblings will put on a postseason, you know, baseball game, and they'll be watching it and texting me about it. That never would have happened before. <laughs> but like, for example, my youngest brother, he's a huge, he, he was a big Astros fan and was, you know, rooting for the Astros. And because of certain things, like certain stories that I would tell him about certain players. And he felt like he would, he kind of developed this connection in a way with yeah. certain players that he liked and he rooted for but had I not known some of these things about certain players and been able to kind of give him this inside peek into you know various athletes on the field like he wouldn't have cared at all about the Astros and so I think baseball's got to do that they've got to start marketing players they've got to start making players relatable in a way um and, and then that way you know fans have some sort of connection and they root for them especially nowadays when you've got players who you know they bounce around you don't have uh, career you know athletes usually with one team one organization you know people in basketball are lebron james fans they they've rooted for the Cavs. they've rooted for you know the heat now they root for the lakers it's because they're lebron fans right yeah. I feel like baseball lacks that. Yeah. And, and I feel like that's also a great point. You find, you see so many people in the NBA that are LeBron James fans. So they'll root for him in Miami. They'll root for him in Cleveland. They'll root for him in LA. I, I sort of feel that way. 
I, I I see them trying. I see Major League Baseball trying, and I see them doing a better job. And I sort of feel like if a guy, you know, he just signed a mega deal, but if a guy like Tatis moved in five years, the people would follow him. I really feel like he's yeah. kind of that first guy that people would be fans of if he moved to a totally different team. Do you agree with that? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I think he's – but he's creating this persona, you know, about – like about himself that people are they're latching onto they really yeah. like it um people are they have become Padres fans that don't live in San Diego that's what you need before how often do, would you find you know people tuning into the Padres who are not from San Diego or have some connection to San Diego you wouldn't but now that the game is getting a little more exciting now that you've got the Padres with all these kind of on-field antics people are tuning in Look at last year, people were tuning into, you know, the Reds, like Trevor Bauer kind of made the Reds relevant in a way. And mm -hmm. I mean, who would have cared what the Reds in Cincinnati were doing before? Mm -hmm. you know, probably not many people outside of Cincinnati, right. but you know, when you've got all the, this personality on the field, people want to tune in. Like they, they want to watch. It's fun for them. That's how you get like an entire country to become fans of the sport is, you know, you make all games, it doesn't matter what city they're in, have different personalities on different teams, make it exciting. People want to watch regardless of whether they're from there or not. Right. Um, so I wanted to, well, actually I have a side question here. I was looking on your website about who you represent and on your website, it basically doesn't list. It just says you represent a lot of, so I know like, I know a lot. Of, I know the the main ones you represent, but I went on there to like see the whole list, and it basically says Rachel Luba represents a lot of people. And I'm like, what does that mean? Why is there a reason you don't put your list on there? So it's funny because so when I first I haven't updated my website in a while. Um, <laughs> when I first, when I first made it, well, so a lot of other agencies, if you go on there, a fair amount don't list who they represent. Um, and, and not saying like, I'm trying to be like everybody else, but you know, at first I was just starting to, you know, I just launched my agency in 20, the end of 2019. So I'm like just starting out, but I had a ton of people, even just on social media that would judge me for, oh, well, she only has like, well, they say, well, she only has one player or she only has two players. Um, and again, like I just started. Um, right. and there are plenty of, you know, agents that, you know, are on their own that just start that maybe only have a handful of minor league guys and that's it. But because I think I was a female, because I am a female, um, my, my client list was always like scrutinized as to like who she represents and well, is she legit or not? Because if she only has this many players. And so I just kind of got annoyed with that part so it, it actually used to list kind of who who I represented oh. and now I kind of keep it off um because I I just I don't know it creates too many people just giving me crap about anything that they can give me crap about so I like that actually so one of my one of my best friends from back home in Virginia tried to break into the agency and become an agent and took all the tests you need to and did all that stuff and repped like a few minor league players and it's like that's how people start and right. just because you started with you know one of the best pitchers in baseball it's like oh well you only have one client what do you mean that's it somebody has to start yeah. Chip, chipper right. jones's agent started with just chipper jones they were friends and he got launched into the agency because of chipper and now he's one of the biggest in the game and so that's where like so lebron's agent same exact thing lebron's agent you know baseball. Yeah. he was best friends with LeBron uh, growing up. And that's how he became this big agent. But no one views it in that way. Whereas with me, they're like, well, it doesn't count because she knew Bauer and, and, and college or whatever they're going to say. <laughs> and I always just laugh. Like, it used to bother me at first. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, how else am I supposed to start? Like, am I supposed to just start with 100 clients? Like, it makes <laughs> no sense. Um, but I eventually got to the point where I realized, like, look, most agents also, they don't come, come onto the scene with one of the most high profile players. Right. And so, you know, a mix of the fact that I did come onto the scene with a big player. So people knew immediately, like, okay, this is who she is and she's here. Um, and then they were like, well, where are her other players? 
Um, but you know, I'm also a, a female, so they'll scrutinize everything. And so I just had to learn to, and no other agents are really on social media. So no one else, I guess, gets the same amount of shit that I get. Um, largely because they're just, they don't make themselves that accessible. accessible yep. So comes with the territory, I guess. Yeah. So one, one player you do have is Yasiel Puig, who, um, is, is also a, uh, you know, a well-talked about player and a dynamic player and, and in the spotlight a lot. Um, what it, walk me through what, what his deal is right now. I know he just signed down in Mexico how did how did that come about and is the plan to get him back over here in the states yeah i mean look he's not done with baseball he also i mean he shouldn't be done with baseball he just turned 30 years old he's still an incredible talent um, and i truly believe like baseball is better with Puig in it um he so he didn't have the year last year he was, I recruited him this, the beginning of this off season. Mm -hmm. So last year he had a different agent, he didn't have a job for a variety of reasons, just couldn't come to, a, you know, an agreement on a contract. And he ended up just, you know, sitting out the season. Um, you know, when I ended up signing him uh, shortly after there was a civil suit, like an accusation that was made, which is unfortunate because the civil process in court takes a very long time to get hashed out. Um, and for a variety of reasons, he's been kind of blackballed in a sense. Uh, no one really wants to touch him just because of, of the civil suit that's out there. And I think it's, it's frustrating for him. Um, you know, especially just because I, there really isn't an MLB investigation. They've looked at it realize there's, you know, nothing really to investigate, but, uh, you know, people, they don't want to deal with, I guess, the headache of even having, you know, media people write an article about it and question it. I don't know. So, um, look, I thought it was important that he still, he still needs to play. He can't sit out another season. And so, you know, we were able to kind of talk him into, uh, you know, going to, going to Mexico, playing there um, until, you know, he can get an opportunity back in, in baseball and in, in MLB. Um, you know, that's a, that's a tough pill for someone as talented as Yasiel to swallow, I think. But, you know, he's gone to the point where he realized while baseball needs Puig, Puig needs baseball too. And like, yeah. that's been his livelihood. That's how he got to America. I mean, Cuban players get here by human trafficking. Like, that is how they get here. Yeah. They they fight for their life. Um, baseball saves them. Baseball gets them out of their situation in Cuba. And, you know, this isn't the first time he's had to, you know, kind of fight for something and fight through, you know, some low points. But, uh, you know, he's over in Mexico right now. And, um, you know, we set up the contract in a way, you know, he's one of the biggest names probably that's been, been in Mexico. So oh, yeah. they're pretty excited to have him. And, uh, his contract set up. So there's no, no, there's no buyout where normally, uh, you know, for a, another league to be able to get a player who's already, who's playing in a different league, they would have to pay that league, that team some money. Um, there isn't that in his contract. So essentially if an opportunity were to open up, whether it's in Asia or in MLB, he would be able to get out of his Mexico contract. Oh, and nice. Play. Nice. So I, obviously, it's not the goal to go play there. Did you have to push him? Were you kind of the one that was like, look, you, you need to do this right now? Yeah. Um, I, yeah, he <laughs> wasn't, he wasn't, you know, definitely wasn't asking us to, you know, <laughs> asking me. I want to go play in Mexico. Um, you know, it, it wasn't something he was too, you know, too enthusiastic about. And, you know, when I first brought it up, I don't think uh, you can get the best response from him. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, he, I think he realized this will be best for him. Um, of course, you know, I've gotten a bunch of criticism on social media about it first, you, you know, have. where is we, you know, why you're asking, you must be asking for too much money. I'm like, yes, surely, because you random fan know <laughs> what's going on. But, uh, and then once, you know, we got him the contract in Mexico, it's, you know, he's one of the best players. I can't believe that's the best you could do. Like, again, 
you clearly know so much about the industry, but uh, you know, he's look, he's, I think excited just to be playing again. Uh, you also represent a softball player, Paige. Uh, tell me how it's different representing a softball player. Obviously, uh, there's the obvious things that come to mind. What's more difficult, and it's that you know it's not near as uh, as big of a sport as Major League Baseball, and there's not as much of a, oh well at the top of the sport you go play here. Uh, one, how is it representing her, and and what are the challenges with representing a softball player? So representing for the first time, I don't know like softball really at all at first. And uh, when I was helping her with her professional contract, I I remember calling another uh, another softball player that I played professionally for a while, and I just kind of like told her about the contract and was like, "Is this normal? Because <laughs> this is nothing. The money." And she just laughed. She was like, yeah, this is what softball players get. I mean, for a season, like they're lucky if they get, I mean, 10 grand is a lot. And which is like just shocking to me because given the time and like what a baseball player will get, right? Um, So the money for a softball player actually like does not come from playing professionally in that contract. It comes from the endorsement deals that they get. So a lot of, you know, representing her is, um, you know, kind of building her brand and the, you know, the endorsements and, you know, so- the softball world, the softball industry, especially when it comes to, um, you know, the youth softball players, they're able to do a lot with them and camps and things like that. And so they can, they can do really well with that. Um, but the actual sport professional, there's like no money. Oh, wow. Interesting. So where, where is she? Like, when you sign with it, like what, what league is she in and where is she right now? So she actually played with Athletes Unlimited. So it's actually a brand new league that just started. Um, and I think they're doing multiple professional sports. And like, I think they're doing volleyball, some other things, but it's a really interesting new league. Um, but they have the whole marketing the game and making it more exciting like Love they've that. got that part down and I think it's it, it's it was really cool to see even last last season when they did it um they mic'd players up things like that so they're definitely kind of at the forefront of being progressive kind of in the baseball softball world cool. um but that's where that's where she went out to play um but I know it, like Japan has a lot of uh, a lot more opportunities as well for softball players. Um, so she's, you know, thought about going over there. Uh, she's been doing a lot of stuff with momentum too, and just in baseball in general. Yeah. Her brother's a minor league player too. So yeah. she, well, she's done like during quarantine last year, she did live at bats with, um, you know, Bauer and Dietrich and Frankie Montas and uh, Jose Ramirez That's and all cool. those guys. So, so you have, uh, I know you're, you have mostly baseball and you have baseball players, you have some coaches, but you do have a softball player. What is, what are the long-term goals for Luba sports? Like, do you want to own the baseball space or do you want to branch out into other sports? Um, I, you know, I first want to kind of be a prominent figure in the baseball space, but ultimately I believe that the, the fee structure and the way I have my agency set up could be you know valuable in many different sports um as well as just kind of talent representation you know in general um so ultimately i think the goal is to expand you know throughout um even in sports things like that but i definitely do want to get a stronghold on uh, baseball first all right so every guest we have on i ask a a set of questions like a career moments type of thing and Rachel you're no different you're no different than anybody I've had on so you get the career moments questions so my first question to you would be what was your welcome to the agency world moment my welcome to the agency world moment probably uh that's a good one um I would say just like my first 
uh, agent meetings experience where I walked into a room with like 450 dudes and <laughs> Ken Rosenthal had already written an article, which I wasn't planning on really being very loud about me starting an agency at first. And he wrote it like three days before um, there were agent meetings. So I was kind of like, oh God, like I, this is a lot of attention. So I wanted to blend in. And then I realized real quickly, like you walk into a room with 450 dudes, like you're not blending in. <laughs> it was an intimidating kind of experience. What has your favorite moment of your career been so far? Probably, probably like Bowers press conference in LA being there and realizing it like after a season, an off season full of, you know, people questioning whether we could even get him a 30, you know, million dollar AAV or something. Um, just like knowing kind of the record breaking contract that we got him and seeing him in LA, especially given that Bauer and I, you know, both went to school at UCLA, it's where we met and just like how far we've came. That's cool. That's really cool. And and when you look at your journey as a whole, what would you say is the most pivotal moment in your career? Um, I would say when I started to kind of just, when I got on Twitter, as much as I hated Twitter, and I put myself out there, and as much crap as I've gotten I think when I kind of just realized like you have to embrace it like nobody else is doing this no other agents are really out there on social media giving people access like this and you know showing them kind of your side of things um I think that was when I realized like look you're doing something different and this is like there is a rhyme and reason to what you're doing. Um, and that was probably like the moment that, you know, I realized like, all right, this, like I'm going down this road. Yeah. Um, by the way, speaking of Twitter, before I let you go, Mets fans hate you. Like oh my absolutely God. hate you. What, why? And, and what, what exactly happened? So, Mets fans, I think, so no agent has ever been so transparent and so public about a negotiation as big as someone like, you know, with Bauer. So I don't think fans really understood like how agents do their job. Um, they, you know, you create leverage. Your job is to get your player the best contract possible. That, that's what we did. And Mets fans, I think they were so set on the, I mean, look, media, there were a lot of leaks by teams uh, to the media and media was making it pretty clear that Trevor was going to go to the Mets. So everyone was very set on, you know, that's where Bauer's going. And the fans felt like they got played and that it was my fault or something. Um, so they were very mad at me for that. They said, you know, you have no integrity Mets will never negotiate with you again, which is silly because like, this is how the industry right. works. And they like, know that. Yes, this is, this is how agents do their job. But I don't think that fans have ever really seen that because nobody has, you know, been given access to a negotiation the way Bauer and I did. So they hate me <laughs> one for that. And then there was, you know, Bauer's marketing team that he has. There was the, mishap with the website thing that <laughs> happened Mets took that very personally which I, look it wasn't that wasn't great at all um and Bauer almost changed his made his decision based off of that and you know I, I look I told him obviously when you know he had two options you know it, it's his choice but you know I had to make sure to make it clear to him like we will not make a decision based on something that an accident that happened like you don't make a decision on that and ultimately you know he decided for a variety of reasons that the Dodgers was the best fit for him but uh, that, that 
whole thing, I think, really made Mets fans mad. And yeah, they don't like some this. have. <laughs> So, uh, it's it's pretty it's pretty remarkable but the the best part is they still, like a lot of them still follow me and make it a point like every day to go out of their way to like say mean things and to respond to things so i think they secretly love me so he it sounds like he almost he essentially had his mind made up and almost totally changed where he was going to go because he felt so bad that it happened yeah, he was like, look, wow. I have integrity and I wouldn't do, I don't like, I was engaging different fan bases because I think it's good for the sport, but I would never lead on, like, I wouldn't do that to a fan base. And he was like, my, I have to, I can't do that. Like, I can't, that can't happen. And then I choose a different theme. And, you know, I like, I get it. And like, I respect him for that. Um, but yeah. at the same time, like, that was out of your control and you this is a you know this is a huge decision like cannot be based on that yeah that makes total sense well rachel thank you so much for joining me this was a lot of fun you can always come back on whenever you want i had a blast thank you for joining me and good luck to you and to luba sports and uh thank you again yeah i appreciate it thanks for having me it was fun all right i just wanted to thank rachel for joining me look that Trevor Bauer story was interesting in itself. The fact that he almost signed with the Mets and because of that whole situation, uh, I hadn't heard that before. So really cool to hear Rachel talk about that there. And I also found it interesting uh, how her agency has run so different. I just assumed um, she was very similar to all other agents and just off the top, they get a certain percentage of an overall deal. So really cool to hear her go in depth on that and how her agency is run. And I just wanted to thank her for joining me this week. But now it's time for the hotline, one of my favorite segments of this show where you guys can call in, ask me absolutely anything you want, vent about your team, uh, ask me questions that happen throughout the week. I love this segment, so I wanted to get started with this week's voicemails. So Rick, hit me with the first voicemail. Hey Ben, this is Rob from New York, uh, long time listener, first time caller. I'm a Mets fan and during our last series against the Red Sox, there were fans at City Field booing Francisco Lindor uh, 19 games into a 10-year contract. And I've seen Yankee fans do the same to Stanton for the last several years. I was wondering their take on, is it ever okay to boo your own players for on-the-field struggles? Um, and if so, how far into the season does it become acceptable? Because I'm sure 19 games is not the answer. Anyway, I'll uh, hang up and listen for your response. Thanks. <laughs> Rob, thank you for the question, uh, and, and I, I love this question because I'm, I'm fairly passionate about this. I hate it. I, I hate booing your own players with a passion. Um, I, think we have, I think we have an issue with it, and I think the fact that they're booing Francisco Lindor, like you said, 19, 20 games into a 10-year deal is insane. Look, I, I'm, I, I'm fine booing the opponent. I'm fine booing the other team. But this is your guy. He's your guy. And he's one of the best players in the league. He's one of the best shortstops in the league. And he's just coming over, moving his entire family, moving to New York City, where you're absolutely torn apart if you don't do well. He doesn't need, he doesn't need the fans on the other side. Look. He knows more than anybody he's struggling. I promise you that. I promise you he knows he's struggling. So stop going after him for having a rough stretch to start the year. I absolutely hate when your own players are being booed. I just don't get it. You want him to do well. He wants to do well. Everybody in the Mets organization, including the fans, want him to do well. And he knows that it's not going well. So stop booing the guy please and I also wanted to talk about how we just have a booing problem all together in baseball look we got to cut this out there is a huge problem I've been to now a few different stadiums this year and there's becoming a booing epidemic and it's awful a pitcher a pitcher picks off the opposing pitcher picks off to first base boo uh, 
a, a reliever comes out of the bullpen in the fourth inning, boo! What are we doing, guys? Like, would you have rather them not show up? Would you have rather them just stay home? Like, it's becoming ridiculous. And I get it at some points. And, and look, it's just like we need to there, – there's a booing problem, so I'm glad you asked this question because first and foremost, the thing I hate the most is booing your own players because nobody's being harder on themselves than Francisco Lindor. That I can promise you. So please, Mets fans, give it a rest. It'll turn around. He's one of the best shortstops in the league. All right, voicemail number two, hit me. Hey, Ben, this is Richard from Richmond. Do you remember an incident when you played for the Stanton Braves involving a clearing of the bench that was not caused by a fight? <laughs> Great question. I do remember a clearing of the bench that did not happen because of a fight. I totally forgot about this until just now. I was playing in a summer league in college uh, in Stanton, Virginia, in the Valley League. And we cleared the benches because a skunk was found in a dugout. So, so, so there was no fight. There was nothing. All of a sudden, I just see players running out of my dugout. And I'm like, what's going on? What, what am I missing? What am I missing? And all of a sudden, I hear skunk. So, so we run out of the dugout, and the game is delayed a good 20 to 30 minutes because there was a skunk literally in our dugout. It was an older field, an older stadium, and apparently this skunk lived underneath the stadium, and every once in a while, it decided to crawl out. And uh, this game, it sure did, and it was a stinky situation. <laughs> but great question. Hit me with the next one. Hey, Ben, this is Carl. Wanted to know your thoughts on all the talk revolving around exit velocity. It seems like this is all we are talking about now. And in my view, this is not a real stat. No one is getting a contract based on exit velocity, yet Disagree this is with that. all we talk about. Why should I care as a fan about the exit velocity? In my head, 80 miles an hour versus 110 miles an hour, as long as it's over the fence, that's all that should matter here. Why are so many people just so invested in this non-staff? Thanks. All right. I, I like that question. Uh, but where I'm going to disagree with you is that it, it's not helping or hurting players with, with contracts. I disagree. And at the end of the day, this is a business. Baseball players are judged based off of what they do on the field. And as we get more and more numbers and more analytics, it's becoming even more so you're judged by your numbers. And I promise you, teams are looking at exit velocity as a stat when determining uh, w how much to pay a guy. Oh, okay, in 2015, your average exit velocity was this. In 2020, your average velocity went down two miles an hour uh, so you're clearly on a downward trend. So we're not going to pay you as we would have if it were this. It, it matters. I promise you. It's the same with, with spin rate. Is it an actual stat? Uh, no. But it's a number that we get. It's a number that we know. And it's a number that we know what it means. And it matters. And teams are looking at it. And, and I promise you it matters. But if, th that's not the only reason you should care. But I also think it's just, I think it's cool. I think that's the thing that for fans is it's cool to see. Like, it's cool to see Giancarlo Stanton hit a home run and see that had a 115 mile an hour exit velocity. Um, but yeah, but, but for the most part, I understand what you're saying. Like, uh, you know, it's not a stat that goes down in the record books by any means. But, but why you should care about it is because your favorite players are being judged off of it. I promise you that. So thank you for that question. Thank you for all of your voicemail questions. Uh, these were fun this week. So make sure you're getting all those questions in. Uh, the number is 213-537-9339. So please make sure you're getting in those questions weekly. Uh, I really enjoy this part of the show. It is a part of the show where you guys can call in, ask me some questions, voice your concern with the team. 
Uh, so thank you for getting your questions in this week. But that brings me to my six tool player of the week. This week's six tool player of the week, Nick Castellanos of the Cincinnati Reds. Uh, look, this guy has just been asking to be the six tool player all year, and it just hasn't worked out until this week. Nick plays the game with passion. He plays it with strong energy. That's what we love here. That's what the six tool player is all about. But look, if you want to look for a certain moment, let's go back to just the other day. Let's go back to Sunday. He had five hits. He had two homers. He had a walk-off hit. One of his homers was on a 3-0 count. We love swinging 3-0. We love it. But look, Nick from the beginning of the year has been playing this game really, really hard. He's been playing with a lot of energy. He's the reason he, he started, uh, if you remember that fight earlier in the year between the, the Reds and the Cardinals, Nick stood up over the pitcher, said, let's go in a little, in a, in a way that wasn't as nice as that. Um, and look, he, after the game, he went on about how he just plays with energy, plays with passion. And, and that's what I love. He had an incredible week this week. He was flipping bats. He was hitting homers. He was, uh, he was hitting walk-offs. So this week's player, or six-tool player of the week is Nick Castellanos of the Cincinnati Reds. This week, though, is the first episode of the month. So I wanted to get into my top five power rankings of the month, which is something I'm going to do on the first of every month, uh, the, the first episode of every month. So I wanted to get into my top five. And at number five, I have the Chicago White Sox. Uh, this week, they had a tough injury. Luis Robert went down. So the White Sox I have at number five, they're still playing well. They have a lot of talent on that team. They have a bunch of guys that I can promise you will be six tool players at some point this year. And it's still a perfect combination of young, exciting players and good veteran players. And they're playing good right now. I like the, I like the White Sox in the American League and I have them at number five on my power rankings this week. At number four, the Milwaukee Brewers. The Brewers are a fun team to watch. I think they have the best one-two punch in the rotation in all of baseball. Brandon Woodruff and Corbin Burns, who is, is out right now with COVID, but he is incredible. And if it weren't for the best pitcher on the planet doing his thing in New York, Burns would be the front runner for NL uh, Cy Young at this point. But the Brewers are playing great. Uh, they're, they're leading the NL Central. They're, they're, their offense is playing well. Their pitching has been dominant, much better than I anticipated at this point. And they're a really exciting team to watch. I have them at number four in my power ranking. At number three, the Boston Red Sox. I'm happy about this one. I, more so than most people, was on the, Re the Red Sox bandwagon to start the year. Did I think they would win the division? No. Do I still think they, they, they won't? Yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like the Yankees are going to turn it on. But for right now, the Red Sox are proving me right. They're surprising a lot of people. They're playing fantastic baseball. They're leading the AL East. They got J.D. Martinez raking. They got the home run cart, which is probably my favorite celebration in all of baseball right now. You hit a home run, you get to go in a shopping cart in the dugout and push to the other end and act like a little kid in a grocery store. It's great. The Red Sox are playing great baseball. They're number three on the power rankings. At number two, the San Diego Padres. This team is awesome. It's probably my favorite team to watch right now. Uh, the rotation's there, the offense is there, and they proved themselves against the mighty Dodgers. They went into LA. They proved they can win. They proved they can beat the best team in baseball. They were there. They were there. They went into the enemy territory. They won three out of four games. And for me, I think that was a big series for them. But, but for them, I think that was a big series. They went into Los Angeles to take on the Dodgers and they won three of four games. And they proved that they can win and they proved that they can win on the big stage. And that's why I have the Padres at number two. And number one, I have the Los Angeles Dodgers. Look, I save, save it. All of your, they had a bad week, blah, blah, blah. I don't care. The Los Angeles Dodgers are the best team in baseball. If they were to get matched up with anybody in the league right now in a five game series, a do or die must win, I would pick them to win it because they have the best roster, they have the best pitching rotation, and that is why I have the Dodgers as the number one ranked team in all of baseball still. It could change if they have another week or two 
of not playing good baseball, but for right now, they're loaded up with injuries. Uh, they're loaded up with talent, though, and I would pick them to win in, in any series right now, and that is why the Dodgers are my number one ranked team in this week's power rankings. So that does it for this week's episode, episode number six of Flippin' Bats. I wanted to thank Rachel Luba, my guest, for being awesome. Thank you for joining me. I wanted to thank you guys for joining me. Now make sure, if you're not subscribed, hit that subscribe button anywhere you listen to your podcast. Make sure you're following. We have a bunch of social media. We have Twitter. We have Instagram. We have YouTube. We have Facebook. Make sure you're checking all that out. Uh, it really means a lot. I love interacting with you guys there. Uh, so keep doing that. Make sure you subscribe. Five-star rating. Thank you guys so much for joining me. This was a blast, and I will see you next week on Flippin' Back. High fly ball, deep center field. It is gone. Home run. And a huge bat flip to celebrate. Thanks for watching. If you love flipping bats, swinging 3 0, or just talking ball, join us. Call us at 213 537 9339 with your questions. We have a weekly guest, and we have a lot of fun. So hit that subscribe button.